Welcome to this video about random forests for classification. Random forest is a method for classification or regression which is based on decision trees. I therefore recommend that you watch my video about decision trees before watching this video. Let's say that we have the following data of 9 men, where 4 of these are known to have prostate cancer and 5 are known to be healthy. For each person we have information about the age the prostate specific antigen concentration in the blood, as well as a score from 1 to 5 based on an MRI scan of the prostate, where a score of 1 looks normal, whereas a score of 5 is a strong indication of cancer. Note that we need a lot more data points to create a useful decision tree and to run a random forest. I have here only used 9 individuals, because it will then be easier to explain how the method works. Suppose that we will build the following decision tree based on all data points. This tree is used to predict if someone has prostate cancer or not. If a male is younger than 55 years of age, it is quite unlikely that the person has prostate cancer. The tree therefore predicts that the person does not have prostate cancer. If the person is 55 years or older, but has a PSA level that is less than 4 nanograms per mil. The person is predicted to not have prostate cancer. However, if the person has a PSA level that is equal to or greater than 4, and an MRI score that is equal or greater than 3, the person is predicted to have prostate cancer. To confirm this prediction, one usually takes a biopsy of the prostate in order to identify tumor cells. This tree was based on the following data. The following person is correctly predicted to have prostate cancer, because the person is older than 55 years of age, has a PSA level greater than 4, and an MRI score that is equal to or greater than 3. The second person, which we know is healthy, is correctly predicted to be healthy, which is also true for person number 3. Person number 4 is correctly predicted to have prostate cancer, and so forth. We see that the decision tree makes a perfect prediction, because all healthy individuals are predicted to be healthy, and all patients with prostate cancer are correctly predicted to have prostate cancer. However, this might be a result of overfitting, as we discussed in the previous video. We must therefore evaluate this tree by a test dataset. The structure and cutoff values of a decision tree also varies a lot if you make a small change in the training data. To overcome the problem by overfitting and large variance when we use decision trees, the method of random forest was developed. A random forest is simply a forest of many decision trees, where we base the prediction based on many trees which then reduces the variation and removes the problem of overfitting. To explain how a random forest works, let's begin by putting our three variables up here, and the nine individuals up here. We let m define the number of variables we have, which is here equal to 3, whereas n defines the number of individuals we have, which is equal to 9. The random forest begins by taking a bootstrap sample of the data with a sample size of n. This means that we should select n cases at random with replacement. For example, just by chance we happen to select person number 6 and person number 3. Since we sample with replacement, we might happen to select the same individual again. We here happen to select person number 6 a second time. We continue like this until we have collected a bootstrap with 9 cases, which can be seen as a training dataset. Note that, due to chance, person number 1, 8 and 9 were never selected. These data points are called out-of-bag cases, which can be seen as a test dataset. The number of out-of-bag cases can vary due to chance, but usually represents about one third of all the cases. In step 2, 
we build a decision tree based on the bootstrap sample. However, at each node, we only randomly select k variables or features out of the total number of variables to generate a variety of trees. Usually, a recommended value of k should be equal to the square root of the number of variables. In this case, we therefore set k equal to 2. This means that we should select 2 out of the 3 variables. For example, let's say that the two variables age and PSA were selected. The variable that results in the lowest Gini index, as we discussed in the video about decision trees, is then selected as the root node. Suppose that the variable PSA resulted in the lowest Gini index based on the bootstrap sample. We'll now continue to grow the tree until the two groups have been fully separated. We see that we should continue to grow the tree because these data points consist of a mixture of healthy individuals and patients with prostate cancer. We therefore again randomly select two variables. Let's say that we selected the variables PSA and MRI this time. Suppose that MRI results in the lowest Gini index out of these two variables. The variable MRI is therefore selected as the second node in the tree. Since the leaf nodes are now completely pure, the tree stops growing. The final tree looks like this. We can now validate how well this tree predicts on out-of-bag data. In this case, person number 1 was correctly predicted to have prostate cancer, whereas person number 8 and 9 were incorrectly predicted by the tree to have prostate cancer. Since two out of three individuals were incorrectly predicted, the so-called out-of-bag error is therefore equal to about 66% for this tree. Let's put aside this tree here. We now repeat the first two steps again, where we take a new bootstrap of the same size as before. This time, person number 1, 3 and 7 were by chance not included in the bootstrap sample. Out of the two randomly selected variables, the MRI variable generated the best split, which explains why it is here used as the root node. Then we randomly select two new variables, where the variable age now happened to result in the best split. We then randomly select two new variables, where the variable age again happened to result in the lowest Gini index. We now have two trees. If we continue this process, we'll generate many decision trees that form a forest. Let's say that our forest consists of only six trees. Normally, you should have at least a few hundred trees in your forest. We'll now see how this forest predicts each case. The case is predicted based on the majority vote of the trees. However, only trees that were developed or trained without the influence of the case are allowed to vote. Usually one third of the trees will therefore vote for each case. Let's say that the first case was not included in building these three trees. Based on this tree, the case is classified as having prostate cancer. And based on the second tree, the case is predicted to be healthy. And based on the last tree, the case is predicted to have prostate cancer. Since two out of the three trees predicted prostate cancer, the majority vote is for prostate cancer. The first case is therefore predicted to have prostate cancer. Then we do the same for the second case. Let's say that the second case was due to chance not involved in building these two trees. In this example, one tree predicted prostate cancer, whereas the other tree predicted healthy. In this case, we have a tie. A tie can be broken at random, or avoided by only allowing an odd number of trees. Let's say that the forest makes the following predictions. Since 4 out of the 9 cases were incorrectly predicted, this means that the out-of-bag error is equal to about 44%. Our forest is therefore not useful in predicting prostate cancer based on this example data. This is mainly due to that our sample size is too small for classification. What is nice about this method is that the outer bag data works as a test dataset, 
which means that we both train and validate our method during the procedure. To know how many trees that we should have in our forest, we can study how the outer bag arrow changes as the number of trees in the forest increase. The black line in this plot shows the average error of the two groups for a larger data set. We see that the error varies a lot when we have relatively few trees in the forest, whereas the error seems to stabilize when the forest consists of more than 8000 trees. This shows that we select at least 8000 trees for our forest because we prefer a forest with a small variation. Let's have a look at how the random forest would predict a new case. In this example, we therefore do not know if the person has prostate cancer or not. We therefore let the forest predict this for us. The person has an age of 69, a PSA level of 6.1 and an MRI score of 3. To predict the class of a new case, we use all the trees in the forest. The first tree will predict prostate cancer whereas the second tree will predict healthy, and so forth. In total, four out of the six trees predict that the person has prostate cancer. Based on the majority vote, the forest therefore predicts that the person has prostate cancer. One nice feature of a random forest is that it can give us a measure of how well a variable can discriminate between the two classes. One such measure is the mean decrease in the gene index. The gene index is explained in the video about decision trees. For example, the mean decrease in the gene index for the variable MRI is equal to 0.9, which is based on the gene index of the following four splits, if our forest consists of only these six trees. A good variable should have a relatively high value because it is then good at decreasing the gene index and therefore good at creating as pure groups as possible. In this case, we see that age is the best variable to discriminate the cancer cases from the healthy controls. Calculating the variable importance is very useful when we have hundreds of variables and would like to extract a few that are good at separating the groups. Finally, we'll end this lecture by comparing the random forests with decision trees. One advantage is that there is no need to run cross-validation or use a separate test dataset in random forest because it internally estimates the error rate by the out-of-bag error. A random forest generally results in higher accuracy or less error than decision trees. In comparison to decision trees, which are highly likely to overfit, a random forest avoids this problem by using many trees that are randomly generated. A random forest also generates a measure of variable importance for classification that can be used for feature selection, and is more robust or less sensitive to exact values in the training data. On the downside, it is much harder to understand how a forest predicts the class of a new case, compared to a single decision tree. Also, since a random forest computes hundreds or thousands of trees, it is much more computationally expensive in comparison to decision trees. Note that both decision trees and random forests work just fine with variables on different scales, such as numerical and categorical variables, in comparison to most other classification methods. Also, there is usually no need to first normalize the data. This was the end of this video about random forest. Thanks for watching.